and get some beats. Yeah.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our online worship at Emmanuel. This is the fourth Sunday in the Easter season, which is Good Shepherd Sunday. And today we worship our Good Shepherd who cares for us and finally takes us home. We begin our worship with the opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, you are the good shepherd who laid down your life for the sheep. Lead us now to the still waters of your life-giving word, that we may abide in your Father's house forevermore. For you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We hear the lessons from God's word for this fourth Sunday in Easter, again, Good Shepherd Sunday. The first lesson is written in Acts chapters 6 and 7 and is also the basis for the sermon. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. He presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen. To this Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, Listen to me. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, 
I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is written in 1 Peter chapter 2. It is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example 
that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, alleluia. The gospel acclamation leads us into the gospel for this Sunday, written in John chapter 10. Glory be to you, O Lord. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. I wish that all of you kids could be here in church at the front for the children's devotion, but that's okay, you can watch it at home. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd, King David said, I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. If Jesus is the good shepherd, and he is, then we are the sheep, and we are. We are the sheep of the good shepherd. Jesus teaches us a lot of things by calling himself the good shepherd and calling us his sheep. Sheep sometimes like to go astray. They like to run away and do their own thing. But Jesus is a good shepherd. When they run away, he gently, he brings them back, teaches them to say, I'm sorry, God, and then assures them, I forgive you. Sometimes sheep just get confused. They go all over the place. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. Well, then the good shepherd guides them, shows them, which way to go, or even better, he gets in front of them and he leads them where he wants them to go. Sheep need someone to take care of them and love them. And Jesus says that he loves the sheep. The biggest way 
the best way that Jesus loved his sheep? He died for them. He gave his life on the cross to take away all the sins of all of his sheep. And he rose again from the dead and he forgives his sheep because he loves them and they are precious to him. One final thing that a good shepherd really does, he loves his sheep and he keeps his sheep close to him. God tells us in his word that he gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. They're always on his heart. They're always right next to his heart because he loves them. You are one of Jesus' sheep. You are a lamb of God. Jesus loves you. He forgives you. He protects you. He guides you. He saves you. He's your good shepherd. We continue with the hymn of the day. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The sermon is based on the lesson in Acts chapters 6 and 7. Dear people dearly loved by Jesus. The past two weeks we heard Peter preach at Pentecost. The same Peter who said he wanted nothing whatsoever to do with Jesus was now preaching Jesus less than two months later. What happened? Christ died and Christ rose from the dead. That's what happened. The risen and ascended Christ filled Peter and John and the other apostles with confidence. They did what they were sent to do. They attempted to bring the Jews of Jerusalem to acknowledge their sin and desire God's forgiveness. Numerous times the apostles told them, you killed Jesus Christ, but God raised him from the dead. God provides salvation in the name of Jesus alone. There is forgiveness to all. Preaching this message came at a cost. The apostles were jailed by the authorities Reprimanded, threatened, beaten, and whipped. The violence was growing. But the higher the danger, the more the confidence of the apostles rose. And the more the number of believers grew. 
3,000 to 5,000 and more and more. All these things are happening in Acts chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Then in chapter 7, the killing starts. It's not an apostle. It's a Christian man, a Christian confessor named Stephen. When faced with death, what becomes of Christian confidence then? Before we talk about dying, let's talk about living. Living with confidence. Are you living with confidence? If you're not living with confidence, you may be living with carelessness. Yeah, I don't really care. I don't really care. All the tasks in front of me just seem, ah, they're not important to me. They don't seem important to anybody else either. What's the point? So you go through the motions. You fill the minutes of the hour. You fill the hours of the day with one day blandly blending into another. That's not living with confidence, is it? That's pretty careless. There's lots of talk these days about essential jobs, essential workers, essential personnel. Along with that, the word hero gets tagged on people. Suddenly, grocery workers are heroes. Medical professionals and care workers are heroes. While it is very good for our communities and very good for us to acknowledge people and what they do, and very good to show gratitude where gratitude is due, we Christians also know something else. You don't need to be called essential by any other human being to know that the way you live matters. You don't have to be called a hero by anybody else to care about the way that you live. The roles and responsibilities in your life, which may have been changed drastically in the past two months, are in your life because God put them in your life. And that's why they matter. You are not living for the praise and thanks of other people. You are not even living for yourself. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. He cared about you. He cared about your life now. He cared about your life forever. He died for you and for me. His love for us is what compels us. So we don't live for ourselves we live for him who died for us and for him who was raised again. We are living for a risen Christ. That's confidence. If you're not living with confidence, you may be living with something else. I hesitate to even use the word because to accuse anybody of this is terrible, but it does need to be mentioned. There's a verse in the Bible that haunts me. It's frightening. Toward the very end of the Bible, God is talking about who will inherit eternal life, and on the flip side, who will die a second eternal death in the lake of sulfur. As far as those who end up in hell, God mentions the sexually immoral, the murderers, occultists, liars. But at the top of that list, even before unbelievers are cowards, people guilty of cowardice who are paralyzed by fear and have no Christian confidence in their living or in their dying. We may secretly think, you know, if I'm ever faced with an, an uncomfortable situation or maybe even a dangerous situation, 
Why can't I just evade and then come back later and repent? Well, along with Jesus saying, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. You have God putting at the top of the list cowardice as a reason why people go to hell. We should not deceive ourselves into thinking, I can act like a coward and then I'll get my confidence back later. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are those who believe and are saved. We have a confident Savior who lived for us and who died for us. He went to the cross knowing he was going to die for our sin, also knowing he was going to rise again from the dead. And he did. He did all that to save us from our sins of weakness and fear. That's the Christ we are living for. We live for him confidently. Stephen was a very blessed and gifted man. He had faith in Christ, which, as we heard last week, is a miracle of God in and of itself. <clears throat> He's also described as full of faith in the Holy Spirit, full of grace and power, and full of wisdom. Stephen lived confidently, just like the other six men who were chosen by the church to take care of a pressing need making sure that all the Christian widows in Jerusalem, both Hebrews and Greeks, were treated fairly and equitably in the daily distribution of food and supplies. Stephen and his fellow servants took that task seriously as a task given them by God. They did their best in that matter for the sake of the widows and for the sake of God while the apostles gave primary attention to prayer and to serving the Christian community with the word of God. As all those Christians lived confidently and took care of the tasks in front of them, God blessed the effort. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. How about that? God blesses the efforts as his people take their tasks seriously and carry them out for the glory of God. Stephen even had the ability to do miracles, and that gave him an opportunity to speak. Stephen spoke with confidence. When he spoke with Christian confidence, he ran into conflict with people who wanted to silence him primarily Jews from North Africa and Asia Minor. They had Stephen arrested, and they falsely accused Stephen of two things. Stephen blasphemes Moses and God. Stephen speaks against this holy temple and against the law of Moses. Interestingly, those are basically the same things Jesus was accused of and crucified for. In his rather long speech, which covers all of a long chapter 7, Stephen is doing more than defending himself. Stephen is giving a truthful testimony to the men in front of him about Moses and God, about the temple, and about the law of God. As Stephen runs his way through Israel's history, he puts the emphasis on God and what God did for his people. God appeared, God spoke, God promised, God fulfilled. God was with his people. God heard, God sent, God set free, God rescued, God showed favor. Stephen contrasts that with what the people did. The people rejected Moses as ruler and judge from God. The people refused to obey Moses. The people turned away from God. The people made their own God an idol, and they sacrificed and they celebrated around their idol. They even worshipped the heavenly bodies. 
God gave them a tabernacle to work at or to worship at? Sure. God even gave them a temple. But God is not quarantined at the temple. God does not go into self-isolation in a man-made house. Heaven is God's throne. The earth is God's footstool. Stephen accuses the men in front of him as being the same people, the same rebellious people of the past. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. What a great description for Jesus, the righteous one, who gave his life for us, the unrighteous ones, to bring us back to God. Then Stephen lays out one final accusation. Now you have betrayed and murdered him, you who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. Stephen's words are met with fury and rage. And now the killing is about to start. When faced with death, what becomes of Christian confidence then? How confidently Stephen faces death. I don't know that many or any of us will face a martyr's death. The Lord alone knows. But whatever kind of death we may face, and it can be any kind of death, it doesn't matter. We can face death with the same confidence that Stephen had. Just look at what the risen Christ did specifically for Stephen. Moments before the stoning began, the heavens opened for Stephen so he could see the glory of God. He saw Christ alive and at the right hand of God. Even though Stephen was dying a violent death, as stones were being hurled at his head and at his chest, look at the prayers that the risen Christ produced from his lips. They are truly Christ-like prayers, almost identical to prayers which Jesus prayed on the cross. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, Stephen prayed, just like Jesus had prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Lord, do not hold this sin against them, Stephen prayed, just as Jesus had prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And look what the risen Christ finally did for Stephen. Here he was dying a very violent and brutal death at the hands of enraged murderers. And yet, when Stephen said this, he fell asleep. How peaceful, how comforting. That's the way Jesus always talked about death, but it intruded into the lives of his people, sleep. A 12-year-old girl is not dead. She's asleep. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. And that's what happened to Stephen. He fell asleep. His spirit, his soul was received by the Lord Jesus his body fell asleep. To this day, Stephen's body lies somewhere over in Jerusalem, asleep, waiting for the resurrection at the last day. Christian brothers and sisters, you and I can die with confidence too. Difficult though it is, sad as it may be, we can die with confidence. When we think about dying, it can make us feel alone. To go away from people we love and to go away from people who love us is hard. It can even make God seem far away. But God is not far away. All we need are the eyes to see him. That's all. Like a good shepherd, 
The Lord Jesus is standing at the right of God and standing right beside us all the time to comfort us, to strengthen us, to receive us. I don't know whether you or I will see Jesus with our own eyes the way Stephen did right before his death. The Lord Jesus is certainly capable of that if he thinks that that is what is best for us. But either way, the transition from the green pastures and the quiet waters through the valley of the shadow of death and to the house of the Lord is not as far and long as it seems to our limited vision. The transition from this life to being with the risen Christ is not far. It's not scary. He is right there, and he will receive us, just like he received Stephen. We will be with Christ. Our soul will be with Christ, and our bodies will sleep, waiting for the resurrection at the last day. God grant us to live, to serve, to speak, and to die with the confidence that the Lord granted Stephen. That is the power and love of the risen Christ in our life. The risen Christ makes for confident Christians. Amen. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As a part of our worship, we give our offerings to the Lord. You may do that online or send or deliver offerings to church. Thank you for your continued support of the gospel ministry that's here. We also encourage you to sign up online on the connection card that you have viewed today's service. We'll hear a musical offering.
We pray. Lord Jesus, Good Shepherd, we have heard the sweet sound of your familiar and loving voice in the gospel and have feasted in the green pastures of your holy word. Bless your word in our lives. Use its message to nourish and sustain us as we journey through this life to the next. What joy it is to know that you laid down your life for the sheep, even sheep like us. Gracious shepherd, we are truly confused and foolish without you. Forgive us for the times we wander from you and stray from the call of your voice. Restore us to your fold and protect us from the evil one. When Satan comes in the sheep's clothing of false teaching, expose his lies and guide us in your truth. When temporary pleasures beckon us to follow the wide road to hell, use your rod and staff to curb our sinful nature and lead us in paths of righteousness. Guiding shepherd, bless your church with faithful under-shepherds, pastors who proclaim your death and resurrection as they minister to the souls in their care. Give all ministers of the gospel an unwavering devotion to your word. Tender shepherd, look with special care on all who suffer from loneliness, disease, accident, or loss. Lift them into your comforting arms and embrace them with the warmth of your love. Carry them through life's troubling times. Renew hope and joy in their lives. Loving shepherd, we pray also for your other sheep. Let your voice be heard in all the world. Prosper the work of our missionaries at home and abroad. Give us all the zeal and courage to share with our friends and neighbors the good news of sins forgiven. Use our witness to gather the elect into one fold under your care. Good Shepherd, we especially ask you to remember Craig Kicker as he considers a call to Wisconsin, Joyce Betts, who will be having surgery this week, Connie Jungbluth and Loretta Marquis, who both are battling cancer, Ed Shivanik, who is ill, and also all those who are impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, including members of our congregation. Be gracious to all, help and bless for your mercy's sake. Hear us, Lord Jesus, as we bring you our private prayers. Eternal Shepherd, when our days on earth come to an end and we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, lead us safely to our eternal home. There we will enjoy your goodness and mercy forever. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Oh, Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. The Lord grant you peace for all your days. We close our worship with a prayer to our Father. Thank you to all of us for joining us for online worship. Thank you to our musicians and technicians who continue to bring us worship week by week. Thank you very much. This past week, the governor announced that the stay-at-home order would continue at least through mid-month. We are continuing online worship and online Bible classes here into the month of May until further notice. God bless your week.